how do I get a job in tech? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, Elaine, uh, thanks for having me and, and, and appreciate the warm intro. Um, it's great to be on and, and chat with you uh, about this topic. So, you know, obviously tech is, you know, has been an extremely popular, um, you know, specialty industry for the last decade, at least. Um, and, and honestly, it'll probably continue to be that way. And so, you know, with that said, you know, everyone is looking to try to try to figure out what can they do to align themselves or, or position themselves or just get an introduction to, you know, that 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 niche. And so one of the things is, um, you know, uh, the boot camps, you know, one of those uh, tech boot camps that, you know, they have like a concentrated amount of time, where it's three to six months, you know, some some boot camps or programs are, you know, six to nine months or a year where you'll have a very strong foundation um, within a specific type of coding or programming. Um, it, it, it might not necessarily cover every aspect, but you'll touch on multiple different languages and, and building platforms um, to be able to successfully know how to build and, and write code. You know, um, so that, that's probably the, one of the best ones that come to mind just because um, I know specifically Oregon offers a couple of different ones. I think the U of O hosts one. Uh, a pretty big one and they're they're doing those you know kind of seasonally now so uh, the recruiting for that is uh, consistent and so um, professionals can can really kind of dive in if they have no experience at all um, and can graduate within six months to a year's time and have a really strong foundation of you know knowing how to write code um, at least from a, a um, you know kind of a simple very introductory standpoint so um, you know, I think another thing is um, for, for those that maybe have had a taste of it or, or a little bit of experience with it, um, getting into, uh, you know, networks uh, or uh, groups that offer, you know, guidance and, and help and education on how to write code is another fantastic way. Uh, LinkedIn has a variety of groups, of course. Um, Facebook has a variety of groups as well. Um, but, you know, apps like Meetup, um, is a fantastic resource for, you know, diving in and tapping into, you know, very niche and specialized, um, you know, software engineering or, or just digital marketing in general um, networks to be able to collaborate with other professionals locally um, or just, you know, nationwide, but um, really giving you kind of multiple different perspectives, if you will, on, you know, the different elements of code because, Programming, software engineering, and, and, and just tech in general is a huge umbrella. So, you know, specializing and focusing in on one to three different areas as a professional um, is extremely beneficial. So I, I've had a few friends and associates who have gone to coding school or attempted yeah. to go to coding school and found yeah. that it was just not for them. Sure. So, and I think that there's a couple of schools here in Portland that will give you like a, a sneak peek for a week. So you can decide if that's something for you. Right. For those people who find that coding is not for them mm -hmm. and they still want to be in the tech space, mm -hmm. what kind of advice, what other roles do you see to have a high potential for growth or, you know, upper mobility? What other, what other roles in the tech space are available to people who are just not coders? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's a huge boom right now for uh, project managers um, that is still, can still be a part of that tech space, you know, in a tech company. But like you said, Elaine, not directly a coder themselves or a programmer. Um, of course, there's, you know, the oh so trending digital content creator, um, which can be, you know, someone that is behind the scenes or someone that manages that all those aspects, um, you know, from beginning to end. Uh, but someone that really has a very strong um, experience and background or, or, or wants to get a strong background and, you know, knowing how to appeal, having a, a visual appeal for, for organizations um, is another one. And then, of course, um, digital marketers, you know, how can you elicit it and, and draw attention to your organization uh, for, for people to attract to it for, you know, conveying that consistent, positive, um, uplifting, progressive message that shows that, okay, yeah, we might be hiring and or we might be, 
we've, we've been operating for 20 plus years, but we're also unique. And so getting that message out there is the role of a digital marketer um, and a content creator. So those are some, you know, different routes that someone could go um, within the tech space that that is not directly, you know, a, a Python or, or a PHP, uh, you know, JavaScript coder or web developer or something like that. So, and, and the, the crazy thing is, Elaine, like those, those three that I mentioned, it doesn't stop there, but, uh, you know, out of, you know, just off the top of my head, I know that by, by, by way of, you know, just data and analytics that those are three trending uh, jobs right now that are trending for 2021 um, as far as what's super in demand and, and what employers are, are looking to bring on board for their organizations. Well, I definitely think that with the pandemic, what we've learned is that some roles um, are more translatable in a time where, you know, people aren't gathering and they're not, you know, going on vacation like they used to be. Like the hospitality right. industry obviously took a huge hit. Right. Um, but website developers may not have because that's the only way that you can connect with your customers. Absolutely. Um, given that and given unemployment is at such a high rate, for someone who has just graduated or for someone who has career pivoted into the tech space, Mm -hmm. How do you suggest they differentiate themselves or stand out when there's so many other people in competition for those types of jobs? Yeah, that's that that right there is, you know, going to be something that will continuously evolve and change just with the trends of the market, the staffing market, um, the trends of, you know, our society as a whole and what's in demand and what's popular. But, you know, uh, nowadays, um, resumes are so advanced it's it's incredible you know you'll see pictures on resumes you'll see um you know people that just have their projects or they have a resume for projects and then a resume for you know actual you know uh, tenured experience you know some people put their experience uh, their skills at the bottom and their education at the top so you'll see a smorgasbord of different things but one thing that will always remain the same is resumes will always forever be important whether you're uploading it digitally or you're mailing it in or you have a cover letter. Um, so just off, off start, uh, you know, differentiating yourselves, you know, from a candidate perspective, um, you know, on the resume sake is having, you know, buzzwords and keywords that um, are relevant to the job in which you're applying for. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm looking to apply for a, a project manager position, I want to ensure that the experience that I have is, you know, catered um, to that, that specific role. And it's not fluffed to the point where, you know, it, it's gonna come off as ingenuine um, or, un, you know, unauthentic, because at the end of the day, you, you have to be the one that talks through that experience. So if you put something on your resume that you've never done, or that you maybe only scratch the surface on, when you're in the interview situation, you're gonna have to still be able to walk that walk, talk that talk, you know? So, um, but I, I would, to go back to my point on, uh, you know, having buzzwords is definitely important because aside from just, you know, a talent acquisition team or an HR team or a recruiter visually looking at the resume, there's technology on resume readers now too, where, you know, a resume is uploaded to a system and there's, you know, scans, technological scans that will search out keywords and buzzwords. So if you don't have, you know, project management liaison or implementation or, you know, initial proposal or things like that for that project management job, you are automatically going to be put at the bottom of the list just based off of the keywords. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And um, go ahead. No, you please. No, I was going to say, and again, um, you know, the skills section, I think is a section that gets underappreciated. You know, a lot of times uh, people will, you know, have the, obviously, you know, your experience, your tenured experience is, is skills and, and experience on its own, but having a, an allocated skills or qualifications or expertise section on the resume and at the top of the resume is uber important as well, I would say, because that is the first, aside from your contact information, that is the first thing that employers and, you know, headhunters or recruiters are going to see, you know, so when I look at a resume, I'm automatically going to see, okay, header information, contact email, you know, did they put a geographical, did they put Oregon, did they put Portland, um, and then did they put, 
you know, a skill section. What, what do they feel like themselves bring to the table to an organization that is applicable and most important um, that an organization should have and, and an organization needs, as opposed to just having the experience on there to talk through their, their foundation? Outcomes. You want to see resumes that show outcomes and how contributions are made and how your skills are activated and utilized by a company to complete a project, to fulfill a cost savings, or to have some quantifiable result. Yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. You know, and if you know, again, to put to to put yourself in the the in the shoes of the employer, they want. You know, a lot of employers, especially within nowadays, they want they want information that's going to jump out at them. You know, it doesn't always have to be numbers. You know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, crushed my Q1 goals by 50 percent or, you know, was able to. It doesn't have to be always numbers, but it has to be things that are unique, but also different um, from what they've seen um, that that can appeal to them. So you create the idea in their head, okay, I need that. I've never, or I've never seen that before. What do I got to do to learn more about that? Um, so it's really creating a, a visual presence that, you know, puts you in the driver's seat as the candidate. Ty, for, for kind of parting words yeah. um, for, you know, 52 Limited has a YouTube page that has, you know, lots of career advice about, you know, how to update your resume, your cover letter, how to kind of um, tackle that applicant tracking system that you spoke of. Mm -hmm. But from your standpoint, as a recruiter who is supporting um, technology companies or technology mm -hmm. roles, what is the number one biggest piece of advice that you can give to someone who is trying to move into this space? What would you say would help them get that job? To put, to put it into just one simple thing is tricky. Um, I'll, I'll try my best. I would say um, being your true self or being true to yourself um, and not just doing it because everybody else is doing it. Uh, um, if I've been, you know, let's say as an example, I've been recruiting, you know, for 20 plus years and all of a sudden there's this huge boom and wave of, of, uh, project management or, or, or software engineering. I know that that's where all the jobs are going, right. And or majority of the jobs. Um, but if I'm not going to enjoy that, if I'm not going to, you know, day in and day out, want to continue to be a part of something like that, I should never go to pursue it. And I, I think what happens is people bite off more than they can chew um, because they realize that there is more that goes into it, um, whether whatever avenue that they're looking to pivot and transition into, there's more that goes into it than just getting the skills, getting the certification, and then finding the job. There's there's a lot more time, energy, and effort that goes in. And then there's also the enjoyment factor, you know, which is a lot of times laying the enjoyment factor, you know, can trump the, you know, X's and O's experience, maybe even compensation factor. You know, you, you have to be able, and now we're virtual as far as work for, mo for the most part. So you can kind of work from the confines of your home. However, at some point in time, you know, people will be getting back into the work site. So we have to know that we're going to eventually be back in the workplace. So are we going to really love that position that we're transitioning to on a day in a day, day out basis? So moral of the story is be true to what you want and be true to yourself when pursuing or pivoting into a new niche. Hi, I think in all of the 10 minutes of 52, that is one of the best pieces of advice because it's so applicable to any point of your career, right? right? You spend more time at work and with your coworkers than you potentially do at home or and with your family. That's a fact. If, you don't like, if you don't like what you do, no matter how much they pay you, like to, to wake up and put a smile on your face and do your job either on Zoom or next to someone in a cube, sounds torturous, right? It sounds, <laughs> it sounds so unenjoyable. Like why yeah. would someone do that to themselves? You know, and right. it's really hard to fake, right? right. Like, right. It's really hard to 
put on this show when in actuality you may be just dying a little bit inside. So don't do that yeah. to yourself. Yeah, yeah. And 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 let's face it, the last thing I'll say is, you know, compared to where we were at last year in 2020 from the employment standpoint, we're at like 6.3%, which is the last time I checked. I think that was as of February or of, of this year. So 6.3% unemployment rate means that um, employers are starting to open up the doors a lot more again, and hiring is becoming more and more popular, um, more and more uh, consistent, I, I should say, which what that means is that it's about, to be, it's about to become the candidate market again. The candidate can afford to be picky. The candidate can afford to be choosy, so to speak, and really pick their spots. So to, to go a step further, I would just say be picky. You know, it, there's, unless you are in an absolute bind in a hurting position where you have to find something, change new to, for a position, or you're, you know, you, you just got to get back to work to get away from your screaming kids and you want to get back into something. If, if, unless you're in those situations, be picky, you know, be selective with what you want to pursue. I love it. Thank you yeah. so much, Ty. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I really appreciate your advice. I'm sure people can find you on LinkedIn or via your website if they're looking for additional um, suggestions or advice. Um, I'll also post this on our YouTube page. Great. And yeah. um, I just really appreciate your time and thank you for everyone that attended today. I hope that um, you found the advice as inspirational as I did. Thank you so much, Elaine. Pleasure, pleasure to be on. And, and uh, definitely, uh, if anyone needs to get a hold of me, they can reach me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. I'm super available. I look forward to speaking with them all. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. See ya. Bye-bye.